This is the epicenter of the rat race. And I think coming into 2019, we were all grinding, hustling, trying to get that piece of cheese. Hi, everybody. I haven't done a LinkedIn conversation in a while, and I have, I have been, like, I've had sleepless nights about this one because I've had great people I've spoken to, but I have a true undisputed OG of the streetwear, sneaker, culture, aficionado, expert, like true bona fide as my, as, uh, as my conversation today. And I remember, you know, the first time I met Jeff, I was kind of, I, I, don't, I don't think I was shaking. I'm not that kind of guy, but I was certainly in, I couldn't believe it that I was meeting Jeff Staple. For those who don't know, and a lot of you don't, because this whole sneaker culture thing has blown up bigger than ever. This man, he helped start it. And I'm probably going to get the year wrong. I'm going to say 2005. Um, nailed it. Okay. Okay, good. Good. I nailed it. Um, that Jeff did a collab with the big boss, with the big swoosh, with the Nike, uh, with the dunk shoe. Well, there it is. There it is. And yep. what I'm going to do, just for all you aficionados, and I, I, I trust me, I didn't plan this. I'm going to pull something up here because everyone knows what StockX is. Let's just take a look. You think, yeah. you think Dior's got some, some juice or you think uh, somebody else has? This man has juice. And let's see here. But let's see what a size nine is in, in, in StockX right now. Hang on, I got it right here. Or my size, if I want to buy, are you ready for this? Ladies and gentlemen, lowest ask, $25,000. How, how many of these were made? 250, 500? 150. 150. 150. Okay. So this is sneaker, this isn't gold, this is palladium. This, I don't know what this is, titanium. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, so, so Jeff, uh, amazing guy, super creative, great combination of, of, um, of art, art and science. And, um, you know, so Jeff, with that, you're, you're kind of known now because you kicked it off as the king of collaborations. I mean, you, and, and you name the person, it's Heron Preston, it's Virgil Abloh, it's Sean Stussy. They've all talked to you about these collaborations. So, I mean, you can work with any brand you want to. What are some, like, how, what are some criteria or how do you maintain focus when you're, when you're working on so many projects? Because I know you're, you're not a man who's stretched thin. You have the, Instead, you have the capacity to do a lot of things. So how do you, how do you stay focused? Well, first of all, Nick, thanks a lot for having me on your show, man. This is, this is an honor. I always respected you uh, and your career and what you've done and, and the humbleness in, in which you go about your life. Um, and, you know, we, we've had a lot of great meetings. We've had a lot of great meals together. And it's always, I think, you know, no matter what we do in our separate lives, you and I have some cosmic jive that happens between us we we see eye to eye on a lot of different things so to me this this is just like there should be two bowls of pasta in front of us and we should just be eating lunch right oh, I now love it. You know? i love it but we got to do it in this new we got to do it in this new COVID age spicy rigatoni uh, from from carbone please if you don't mind but keep going <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i mean i mean to answer your question i think you know we were fortunate enough to to start out doing collabs let's call it as the cool kids say uh 25 years ago we started doing collaborations you know um, and it was really just understanding, you know, you know, the Chinese symbol of the yin yang, like the harmonious balance. It's like, you know, I'm going to do stuff really good and I'm going to do stuff not so good. And you're going to do stuff really good and you're going to do some stuff not so good. And if those two things can mirror each other, well, we can create something really, really special. And there shouldn't be any ego. There should just be like, yeah, I suck at this. You're great at it. You suck at that. I'm great at it. Like, let's come together, you know. Um, and so I, I recognize that early. And. Fortunately, Nike, as you mentioned, is one of those brands, those big billion dollar corporations that also recognized that there's more benefit to bringing people in from the outside than hoarding all the information. You know, they were very open sourced about it. And um, yeah, them work, them calling me in to help with, you know, this is this is a, a drawing, a, a hand painting of a pigeon dunk that an artist did for me. Um, it's actually all four of our pigeon dunks that we've done. So we've done four pigeon dunks now. We did the OG the what the dunk, the black pigeon and the panda pigeon. And, and she sort of morphed them all together um, for, for Nike to, to, to come at me with those four opportunities, along with other shoes that we didn't put our pigeon logo on uh, is, is a super blessing and honor. And um, I think, I think one of the biggest things that I'm most proud of, to be honest, is that, you know, my brand is now 23 years old and to stay 
quote unquote hot and relevant for two decades in youth culture and to like Gen Zers and millennials, you know, to be relevant to the next 16 year old kid every single year, that's, that's a challenge. That is really hard to do. And, and I'm really blessed that we've been able to stay relevant in that way. Nice. Nice. Great answer. I mean, we, we have a, uh, you know, at ABG, we've got so many brands, you know, we've got all different levels of brands that hit all segments of, of culture and socioeconomic groups. And we've done some work together. What do you, and we bought some new brands recently. What do you, what do you see? What do you envision? Is there anything that you thought to yourself, boy, we should, Nick, we should do this together. Any of our brands, any of the new brands, old brands, any of the brands that we haven't done already? Um, there's so much opportunity. And I think that's the great thing about the ABG business, not to like sort of um, blow too much smoke up your ass, but you know, you, you've got this great, <laughs> <laughs> well, the way I see it is like, you know, you guys have this great ability to like, spread your chips around and know that you know not everything needs to take off at the same time you you're willing to hold in the pocket on certain brands and wait for the right time for them to sort of germinate you know um and other brands now is the time let's go 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 you know what i mean um and there's so much opportunity at your brand and i'll, I'll tell you a story i remember the first time we ever met at least on a business proposition idea was um somebody in your company called us in to pitch on tap out Okay, first and foremost, to come up with how do we relaunch Tap Out? And this is when, this was before this office, before the last office, it was the office before that, right? And I remember we, we did this great pitch presentation. You loved it. You loved the idea. And for whatever reason, it didn't come about. Shit happens, right? It doesn't matter. And I think one of the big lessons that I learned, and a lot of young people, especially who might be watching this, don't understand is that just because there's no financial transaction between our companies at that moment. It's just business. It's nothing personal. And if I walked out of that meeting with like a chip on my shoulder, or I was like, oh, f that brand ABG, they didn't get it. You know, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. It's all good. It's nothing personal. A couple of years later, you called us back for the Airwalk project. And that ended up being an incredible three plus year relationship that, you know, eventually had its end as well. But again, no hard feelings. We'll do more business later on down the road. We'll have lunch. It's all good. And, and I think that comes down to like the people. And I think that's something that you really appreciate as well is that like, even though this is a serious business, yes, there's lots of money to be made. Yes. But at the end of the day, if you can't break bread with the person, there's like no point in even doing it. You know what I mean? That, Jeff, that's articulated so well. And that's what makes you so great is you're humble and you, you recognize you, you recognize greatness in any form, whether it's financial or whether it's a deal or whether it's any nugget of information. And that, that's what makes you and your company, your brand enduring. And you're right. There are so many individuals you run into that are, you know, at the first roadblock, they're like, oh, you, don't, you didn't get my idea? Forget it. I'll move on. And that's, yeah. Yeah. That, that is not a hallmark right. of greatness. That, that is a hallmark of stubbornness. And, um, you know, your, your inability to kind of see the force of the trees. Well, well said. So what is your, yeah, that's any brand in the world what, or anything, not even a brand, anything. What is this amazing brand you have? And I, actually, it kills me because my black dunks are still, I, I left Florida with the COVID numbers went through the roof. And I left, I, we, we, I remember we were on the plane. I said to my, my wife, I said, I forgot my black dunks. Um, <laughs> but, but what are the, um, you know, what is a what's the ultimate collaboration for this amazing brand you have? What what it like what what's the what's the utopia? Like, oh my goodness, it's the greatest ever. Um this this is a funny story. I mean, I think the, the dream brand for me to still work with would be something like a Nat Geo. Something that is like has a bigger calling. Exactly. Um and yeah, I'm, I I had a you you probably won't remember the story, but like uh, this was when we were working together on the Airwalk stuff. Um, you know, I, I thought Nat Geo might be a brand that like ABG could potentially own. And I was like, maybe there's something here where like you guys can buy the brand. I'll creative direct it. I'll do all the, the goodwill and stuff. And I'll never forget. I'll never forget the story. Yo. You probably don't remember. But like, so you, you love the idea initially. And then so you call Jamie from next door. You're like, Jamie, Jamie, come in here right now. And so Jamie comes in and, you know, Jamie's like, a, it's kind of like a, a bull in a china shop, right? He's coming in and like, he's like, whoa, whoa, what? And you're, you're like, Jeff, explain your, your idea to Jamie, right? And Jamie sits down and he's all like, 
sweating and he's like, tell me the idea, right? And you know what you said? You said, Jamie, hold on now. Jamie, Jeff is our friend. Jeff is on our team, okay? So be nice to Jeff. It's almost like if you didn't say that, Jamie would have eaten me alive, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, and then Jamie was like, okay, I got it. He's our friend. Okay, go. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. He, he gently eats people alive. Yeah, that's true. That's true. With a heart. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. But you, 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 like, set a pick for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> you're I like, yeah, you, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I think Nat Geo is, is one of those brands. You know, NASA is also one of those brands that has, like, a higher calling. But there's obviously an upside to merchandising and productifying like that brand and like i think if proceeds of that went back to nat geo went back to nasa and nasa's kind of doing it in a weird way because almost anybody could use the nasa logo it seems like there's like no controlling of that brand but i think those two brands could really benefit from like a brand shepherd like you guys and us to like you know really position it in a proper way that's a, that's another great message jeff for anyone who's watching or is starting their own brand or thinking about it I mean, you have these brands that are now, you know, that started in something and now they've become something. And I'll, I'll give you an example. We, you know, one of the brands we own is Forever 21. We recently did a Forever 21 7 Eleven collaboration, right? And it's a, you know, there was a time when that would have been laughed out of a boardroom and it blew out of the stores, right? Because it's this, it, it's a defining moment of a generation. And I remember as a kid, you know, you and I, we used to go get, you, you, we both would go get Slurpees, right? And, You'd fill yep. up the, or, the, or the big gulp cup, right? And it was a treat. And you'd go get one of those hot dogs that had been, been on that round thing for three weeks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, whether, whether it was at three in the afternoon or three in the morning. And it was like it brought, it, it clashes cultures and, and times in history together for the same yep. reason that, you know, that I can sit and watch a Star Wars movie with my four-year-old boy or my six-year-old girl. And she will say, look, daddy, it's, it's Chewbacca's planet, Kashik, And I'm just like, oh my, like, you know, like, you know. I, That's I, what I, I said when I was a kid. Yeah, I went to see, you know, I went to see Star Wars in, in 84 or whatever it was, right? And yeah. you're, you're, what you just mentioned, NASA, Nat Geo, Star, those are super brands. Like those are, yeah. those are like, you can't even begin to explain that, that, these, that these brands have endured and not, not necessarily, sure, Star Wars or Lucasfilm, very commercial, but they, they weren't born to be, they were born to be content first, and it became yeah. content, right? Yes. I mean, there's, I, I would, Star Wars is another amazing story, but I, I think that's awesome that you say, for all those that are listening, you know, Jeff isn't saying, oh, yeah, give me Louis Vuitton, or give me Prada. He's saying, mm -hmm. give me Nat Geo, give me, give me NASA, right? That's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Okay, last one for you, and then I know you've got a bunch of stuff to ask me. Um, you, your brand, you know, I think staple pigeon, right? Pigeons, if, if there's any object that typifies the grittiness of New York City, of anywhere, right? New York's known for two things, pigeons and rats, right? And, <laughs> and you know, you, you, you've glorified the pigeon. Actually, that's, that's the wrong word, pardon me. You revere the pigeon. And, you know, whether, yeah. you know, kind of what you've done and you've, brought to the, to the forefront and a pigeon is gritty a pigeon exists in new york and they you know they fly this way they fly that way and they still survive and which typifies yeah. kind of what new york is so new york's been going through some tough times and i know you know you're back and forth the east and west coast and like you yep. know I, I've, you've been here your life i've been here nine years i consider myself a new yorker so what's your, what's your message you know to to new yorkers or those those people who think that new york is is crumbling into ruins what's your what's your message related to the grittiness in New York and, and the pigeon? No, I mean, I, I think New York is, is going to come back from this. And, and also, I think it's, it's probably the mental reset that we all needed. You know what I mean? Like, we were, New York is, is filled with rats, and this is the rat race. This is the epicenter of the rat race. And I think coming into 2019, we were all grinding, hustling, trying to get that piece of cheese. And Mother Nature in the world smacked us upside the head and said, like, don't forget get what's important you know what I mean and I, I know you were you were down south and stuff and we were texting all through COVID like yo when are we going back to New York how's it looking downtown like we both live downtown you know and it's like even though like we we went somewhere else I think now is the time where I think New York can really stand for what it represents it could really pull pull itself up by its bootstraps and really make it so much better than it ever was you know back in in the 80s 
New York had this amazing raw energy that I think got a little bit evaporated in the last two decades, you know, because of commercialism, commerce, you know, just like the whole rat race sort of expounding on itself. And it's time now for a bit of a reset. I think this is going to be a great thing for New York. I think a lot of people will get hurt. A lot of businesses won't, won't survive this. But I hate to sound cold, but they weren't set up to survive this. Like if you weren't set up to last eight months, like you need to reprogram the way you're thinking about doing business. You know, that's not a business. Like, come on, like you got to last through some stuff. And, and no, no disrespect to people who have, who have had hard times, but New York is not for the weak. You know what I mean? And, and it's like New York likes to, I always think of New York. I, I've, I've been to so many cities in the world. New York is the only place that's not really like a city. It's almost like a life force onto itself. It's like a living thing that you have to like, like combat with. Yes. Yeah, it's breathing. And New York will eject people out. New York will be like, you're, you don't belong here. Get out of here. Yeah. Like it flushes. No other city does that. No other city does that. You can adapt to any other city. But New York has a self-filtration system that cleans itself out. And it's doing that big time right now. Like we're doing a, a septic withdrawal right now out of New York City. <laughs> and only the strong will survive. Wow, wow. Everyone, do you hear that? Sean Carter, Alicia Keys, listen, that was an empire state of mind right there. That was, uh, we needed the music. Make a song, just, make a song, Alicia. We needed the music to just start right there, because this, Jeff, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That was input. That's exactly what typifies everything from Billy Joel, New York state of mind, empire state of mind, you know, I love oh, yeah. New York. You can go on and on and on. Uh, and, Hell yeah. uh, and all of us who live here, just for those who are, who are who love to look at the the apparent demise in New York? We listen to those songs all the time, and it still gives me goosebumps. So um, yes, okay, okay, big boss. Absolutely. So what, what do you got for me? What do you, what do you got? We haven't we haven't read. Well, I I want to ask you, you know, because when we when we first met, I remember um, uh, you. I sat in on a board meeting, and I was really honored to actually to be able to sit in as a fly on the wall on some of your, some of your like internal board meetings. And I remember one of the things that you always mentioned was this concept of cash versus craft. And I, I have to admit, I steal that term now and I use that in meetings as well because it so perfectly balances what we have to do as brand shepherds and brand owners. Um, and I wanted to ask first, out of your own words, define cash versus craft for all of us, but then also how you develop that thinking. I'm honored that you use that and there will be no royalties. I'll, I'll say that publicly. Uh, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, um, it, it, I think of it as, as so many people it, or everyone in the world has unbelievable creative ideas in this complex brain and this human condition we have. And it's a matter of, you know, whether you, you, you're creative in, in everything you do, whether you, hammer a nail into a piece of wood or you're a, you're, a, uh, you're a scientist. And at some point you use that craft to make cash. Cash is a term that is used just to live. You could be bartering, you could be doing anything, but just, it's just a term. And in our business, you have to decide that fine line of, if my craft is beautiful and I'm gonna be precious with it. And, but at the same time, is that going to put food on my table. I'm using that as a metaphor, but he's going to put food on my table. You have to make that decision. How do I unpreciousize my craft to continue to make cash while still feeling good about my craft? And those who- Right, and that, that seesaw. That, that is the seesaw. Those who mm -hmm. completely respect their craft and don't make cash, huge respect, huge respect. Because you know, it's, it's the conviction you have for your craft. But those have found that fine line, those geniuses of between the two of them, of that, that healthy tension. I'm gonna use another Star Wars reference here. Yeah. You know, my man Obi-Wan said that, you know, the force is, the, is the, the, the good and evil tension that binds the universe and draws it together. In a way, cash and craft, yeah. there, there's, a, there's a healthy tension between the two that you draw. Right. Too much cash, the brand withers and goes away. Too much craft, yeah, there's a lot of people that- no scale. That, and that pre-COVID could have had a little bit more cash and they had too much craft and now they're wishing they had more cash. You know, and right. I'll stress again, I don't mean dollars and cents here as a material stuff. I mean, just a little bit more equity out of the business. So we, we walk that fine line every day and, and 
you know, I, I think of that all the time because I am a, I like to think I have some good creative thoughts and I like to think I'm good at executing on things, but I also like to turn those into something that creates revenue because ultimately I'm in, I'm in a business and you're in a business that does that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, do you ever see somebody that you mentioned, like who is all craft, no cash and they're doing such an amazing thing, but you just say to yourself, like, you won't last two years doing this. And it's such a shame that the world won't be able to experience you for generations and eons, you know what I mean? And it's like, I always see that I'm like, dude, just get your affairs in order on the cash side so that you can tell your story. You have a platform to continue to talk on. Unfortunately, that platform requires rent, utilities, like you gotta pay a bill sure. for that platform. Yeah, sure. and it's like, so I, I bet you run into those people all the time. But all the time in our industry, and then for me, it's also, I mean, cause I can't help myself to me. It's always with food too. You know, like I'm, I'm like, man, if you could just scale this, you know, this idea you have or this item, you know, you and, and this truck, this food truck, yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. You, you man. And, and by the way, that person, that man, that woman, however they identify, whatever they are, they could maybe, they could say, you know, I'm very content doing what I'm doing. And you know, probably maybe right. a good example of that good or bad is, I forget the name of the movie, the movie with uh, Michael Keaton about Ray Kroc, um, about, about McDonald's, right? Founder. Founder, yeah. Founder. And, yeah. And the idea that these, that these McDonald brothers, you know, created the system and they were kind of happy doing what they were doing, right? And they would have been, yeah. just, you know what, give me four or five McDonald's or maybe just that one McDonald's that would have done very well for mm -hmm. themselves and maybe would have retired, white picket fence and be very happy. But everything happened, right? And it didn't turn out great for them, but but at the same time, like that, that's what happens when the, the healthy tension between cash or craft goes the other way, right? They created yeah. the craft, someone else had the cash and it didn't, I mean, listen, it worked out well for yeah. some people and it created another, <laughs> love it or hate it, created another mega brand. But yep. that to me is that to me is the example of the, of the healthy or unhealthy tension between the two. Yeah, it worked out well for Travis Scott. Recently, yes. Yeah. At least, yeah. Yes, he was doing okay before, but now I, I like. And yeah. Listen, to that. fries with barbecue sauce. He's my man. I love it. Right. <laughs> hey, I want to ask you this too, because you know, through the six degrees of ABG, you have crossed paths with so many different celebrities and influential people, and and even you and I have had some funny stories with some celebrities as well. But yeah. out of all the people you've met, who is the most jaw dropping starstruck where you're like shaking and like, holy f this person's in my room. I, I know I, yeah. a funny story with you. A very funny story. So I remember Jeff rolls into the office. He's walking by and he's, we, have these, we have these glass paneled rooms and Jeff walks by and I'm like, Jeff, Jeff, come here. And he's like, okay, Jeff, he walks in and he's, and Jamie's sitting there. I'm sitting there and Kanye as in Kanye West is sitting there. And I'm like, yeah. Jeff, meet Kanye. And you know, Jeff, Jeff's met a lot of, a lot of big guys and big girls and everything. So he's not, you know, but he's still like, oh, you know, it, it's Kanye, right? It's still Kanye. And, uh, and, then, and then again, ladies and gentlemen, Kanye stands up, he's like, Jeff Staple? Like, Jeff Staple? Like the dunk Jeff Staple? And then it was just like mic drop. It was like mic drop. So you'd want to talk about, you know, real recognize real. And obviously Kanye knew who Jeff was and Jeff, you know, Jeff humbly introduces himself and, you know, um, and then, you know, we start talking a bit about stuff. And I remember distinctly because Kanye had asked me about my, we're wearing a necklace and, you know, on the back, this particular, one of them said 925, a number on it or 950. I don't know why, because it's, it was this logo I had. And he said, he started talking about Kismet and about how, you know, one of the easy numbers is going to be that number. And if you, if you meet Kanye in person, he's exactly, he's the same Twitter stream of consciousness in person as he is. And he's this, you know, this incredible genius that you try to corral. And it was, uh, it was fun seeing Jeff's face because Jeff, Jeff, I don't know why Jeff was in our office, but I was happy to see Jeff. And he's like, Jeff, it's Kanye. And, you know, and I tell you, Kanye doesn't exchange digits with too many people. He changed digits with me. He changed his, his phone number 10 times a week. So I always try to chase him for his number, but he exchanged digits with yeah. Jeff right away. And, uh, that, that was that was fun and and jamie and that i had a lot fun. of fun with kanye and he's uh listen the man's a legend so i don't know what yeah that, that was cool so i i walk by that glass office you wave me in i'm i only see the back of this man i can't see who it is so i walk in i have no idea who it is it's not until i basically turn around that i see kanye and yes i was a little bit like oh my god like you didn't even prepare me for this nick you know but 
Yeah, it was it was honestly like top five moment for me to have Kanye stand up. He gave me that huge pound. Oh yeah. And he he said, Triple OG, of course. And I was just like, Wow, you know who I am. I'm like, that that's awesome. insane, you know. Yeah. And I remember we we were there for like a good 45 minutes. He started getting on his soapbox and talking. He was actually performing at MSG that week. He was here to perform. Of course, he was like, but he had to carve out time for us, Jeff. I mean, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, and I remember, like, you know, there was a lot discussed in that meeting, a lot of numbers, a lot of names, you know, a lot of dollar signs. And at a certain point, I'm just sitting there because I wasn't supposed to be in that meeting, and I'm sitting there listening, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, I shouldn't be listening to this. Like, I didn't sign the NDA or anything. <laughs> and it was at that moment that Kanye says, "Yo, Jeff, I think you should probably leave the room now." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I, I said, I think so too. I 100% agree that I should leave right now. And so I get up and leave and Kanye goes, yo, Jeff, 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 grab my, put your number in my phone. And I'm like, my fingers have never been like more, like, I was like, I'm like trying to get the digits in there, you know? I type in my info and before I got to your elevator, which was like 20 feet away, I get a text from Kanye. Hey, Jeff, it was really great meeting you today, Kanye. And it was just like, wow, he like didn't just throw the digits away. He like was first to text me. And that's just the kind of guy he is. He's just, yeah, he's, he's all over the place. He's very real. And what you see is what you get. And good luck. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, Deb, I, I, if, if you allow me to hijack what you're asking me, I got to tell you another Kanye story. Did I tell you this one about the bracelet? You're going to love this one. No, no, no. Please so say it. Please I, share. I, you want to hear it? You want to hear it? Yeah. So I'm in, um, Kanye was here another time. And he saw, he was wearing a Cartier watch, like, like a, an antique, beautiful Cartier watch. Not super expensive, but just a very elegant, beautiful Cartier watch. And I was wearing this bracelet. And this bracelet mm -hmm. is, uh, I think it's called Le Clou. It's a Cartier bracelet. And he said, what is that? Yo, what is, what is that? And I said, it's Cartier. It's beautiful. And I said, oh, thank you. And then, and then like, I don't know, like, I, and I, you know, I, I go home and I talk to Jocelyn. And I'm like, She's, Kanye was in the office. Tell me about it. Because, you know, you know, we know, we know Kanye and we know Kim. I mean, we know them, but it's always fun to talk, right? Because yeah. you know, these are, these are, love them or hate them. They're icons. And yeah. I, by the way, I, I love, I love the Kardashians. I respect what they do and whatnot. And the Jenners. And Chris is a great friend. And, um, you know, I tell Jocelyn about this bracelet. And then she's like, I don't know, watching TMZ or something like a month later. And Kanye, she's like, and there's a close up. And he's got this bracelet on, but in gold, right? And I'm just like, the man pinched, like he pinched my style. Like, what's up, right? And, but hang on, it doesn't end there. So anyway, I don't, I don't have his number anymore. He changed his number. And, and yeah, then, yeah, I'm yeah. In, then I'm in Moncton, New Brunswick, which is a small town of 200,000 in Eastern Canada, which is my wife's, Jocelyn's hometown. We're out at a local pub. I'm with, um, I'm sitting with Jocelyn and her friends, her high school friends. And over there is my brother-in-law, uh, Dan, and my father-in-law, Don. They're another table. I just came over to talk to Jocelyn and her friends, get separate tables. And I left my phone over there with my brother-in-law and dad, and he come, or uh, father-in-law. And my brother-in-law, Dan, comes over, Nick, it's ringing, and it's a, it's a FaceTime from unknown, right? Or sorry, it's a phone call from unknown. So I, uh -huh. I pick it up, I go, hello, Nick here. Because unknown, either it's somebody who's hiding their number, right? Yo, Nick. <laughs> Yay. This, I hadn't talked to him in months, right? And I'm like, excuse me? I said, hi, you know, hi, Kanye, how are you? He says, I got a problem. And I was like, oh my goodness, I got a, I got a problem. He said, What's the problem? I said, I can't get my bracelet off, right? <laughs> and, and he's trying, and I said, no, no, because there's, like there's like a little hidden clasp on this thing to get it off, right? So I said, I try to explain this to him, try to explain it to him. And then he says, I, I don't understand what you're saying. I said, FaceTime me. So then I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's one of the same, one of those moments, right? Where I'm with Jocelyn's high school friends. And like, I said, I, Jocelyn says, who is that? And I think to myself, in my mind, I'm like, I'm not going to tell her. Because you know yeah. what? I know I just, I said, no, no, it's done. I put my phone down. All of a sudden, FaceTime comes on, right? I answer, it's Kanye. And I said, one second, guys, it's Kanye. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and her friends are just like, you know? And so like, he's holding the phone or someone, one of his buddies is holding the phone and I'm showing him, take the bracelet off. And he, <laughs> and he takes it off. And then I start to talk to him. 
yeah, so hey, and then click, bye. And that was, and that was the, uh, he, he sent me a text after and thanked me, but it was one of those uh, other surreal, here I am in Moncton, New Brunswick, and at this bar, and Kanye's FaceTiming me. And it was one of those typical Kanye moments. Like he just, yep. I can't get the bracelet off, I gotta call Nick. Yeah. He, he'll know. So that was, yeah. a, that was, it was a good moment though. Amazing, amazing story. And you know, the other people, the other person that I recently reconnected with, but I met through ABG is Andre 3000. Of course. You know, we met on the Tree Torn Project and working, yeah, Three Stacks, working with him was amazing. And I'm in LA recently during COVID and I'm at this grocery store called Erewhon, which is like the best grocery store in, in the land. And, you know, it's COVID and like, you know, when people come up close to you, you're sort of like, get away from me, right? And this guy like taps me on the shoulder and I'm just like, you know, no one has touched me like in six months, you know? And it's like, hey brother. And I turn around and it's Andre and he's shopping there. And, you know, he's like, oh, what are you, what are you doing for dinner? Let me, let me cook you dinner. So like he, we buy groceries, he cooks his dinner and everything. And like, it's just amazing. I don't know if you saw, but last week Andre was trending. Is this the viral video you took of him playing, playing the flute? You took that video. Yeah, that was another day though. Okay. Yeah, I took the video, yeah. But like it went trending just because there's like a glimpse of, of Andre. Uh, and it was just crazy. And, and all these like are rooted back to our relationship, which is, you know, really, really special. Yeah, it's, it's so, and there's another, by the way, there's another legend. Uh, my kids now listen to So Fresh and So Clean by Outcast before bath time. You know, so there, there's another. Like, <laughs> that's amazing. That's my wife, Jocelyn. That's yeah, it's another endurance thing. Yeah, without a doubt. All right, I got one last question for you, though. Okay, let's go. Top three, top three all-time kicks. You, I, I love that you've got the, I, I love your sneaker collection. I also love that you still wear shoes onto the subway every day. You, you take that train, you take that subway tiling. This is a man who could, you could helicopter into work if you wanted to, <laughs> but you still metro card it on the subway. And I love that. And for, I, I do want to ask why you still take the subway. Um, I take it because I make shoe contact before I make eye contact. And <laughs> that, that is the, to me, that has always been a little bit of my secret sauce is I love to observe and I love to soak in what people are doing. And there is no better microcosm of what's happening in the world than the New York subway system because they come from all over. Yeah. Every possible yep. walk of life. And I will also tell you that, you know, me being this, you know, this 51 year old guy from Canada, and talk about like when you when Kanye meets you, when real meets real, and when I'm on the train, when I see a couple of you know young guys at the end of the train, and they're looking me up and down, not in a bad way, looking me up and down, and then they see my shoes, and I'm wearing a pair that if you know, you know, and they kind of give me the mm -hmm. old, okay, right? That, that is <laughs> yeah. my that is my vapid level of validation that, uh, and I don't mind saying that that you know if you know, you know. If I'm wearing a pair of you know, 85 Jordan bands, if I'm wearing a, the Igloo Jordan 1, if I'm wearing the, uh, the you know, the, the Jordan 4, Levi's collab customized, right? And I would have been wearing those yeah. if I had them. But, you know, that, that is, that, that, and by the way, riding the train is also, I will say it might be, the, for me, it's a 12 minute ride. It might be the 12 minutes of my daily life where no one is asking me a question or no one is, uh, is, is on me. And by the way, I, Right. I, think, I don't. I understand the the fact that someone needs to talk to me. That's a privilege that I that I have. Mm -hmm. you know, that that people want want to listen to me. So I don't take that lightly. But sometimes that twelve minutes where I can listen to the tragically hip, where I can listen to Bruce Springsteen or something that, or just zone out is because yeah. you know, when you're down there, it's, it's hard to find you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're right. That is the world's best mood board, right? The New York City subway. You can't get a better trend board than that. Like you just see everything. It's the best. All right, so, so top three all time. Can you even answer this question? Whew. Well, boy, without, without offending a bunch of my friends in the industry, I'm going to say it, it. Oh, my goodness. You, you, you know what I'm going to do? I, if I even allow me, I think I, I'm going to categorize it. I'm just going to put it in the Jordan family right now, if that's okay with you. Okay. <laughs> because that is, that is extensive. I'm going to go with probably in this order. Jordan four, Jordan three, Jordan one is what I, 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 I just find the recently the fours, the fours with what's happened with the union collab with the, the off-white yeah. collabs 
And then of course the traditionals and uh, Jesus hard with the three cements. And now, now you got me going with all the others, but in the Jordan family, yes. And then I could have a whole conversation with you on, on other, you know, amazing stuff. But what about yeah, you? You know what, what we have in common is that the Jordan one is not in our, in our top top. That's interesting. And I'll tell you why, like my number one is Jordan three. That's the first time that a sneaker became something that wasn't a commodity used item that became Jordan three became design and artwork. And all of a sudden you had to know about Tinker Hatfield. You had to know about the inspiration behind the design. The Jordan one was still a sneaker that you play basketball with, you know, back when it first came out. And, um, so that's why it's not in my number one. I love the Jordan one, but it just wasn't this other thing like where the Jordan three, I remember every day after I came home from school, I was cleaning that thing with a toothbrush and like redoing the paint on the back and everything, you know? So the Jordan three is my, is my number one of all time, black cement in particular. Of course. Um, and then actually my number two, oddly enough, you know, I was a tennis player growing up and what, what Michael Chang meant to me as a person of seeing my own face at the Paris Open, at the U.S. Open, like beating Boris Becker and Ivan Lendl and these giants, this little five-foot guy, and then him pumping up on those Reebok pumps with a tennis ball fur, that was like, that made my whole teenage year. That's a great thing. You know, like team. all my teenage years. Yeah. That's a great And shape. then, of course. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, that shoe takes color so well, too. Like it's a, you know, I know yeah. all the shoes that we're mentioning, because, you know, we're color guys. To me, a, a hallmark yeah. of a great shoe is can it take color? Love the Stan Smith. It yeah. doesn't, take, doesn't take color blocking. The threes, the fours, no. the Michael Chang shoe. I mean, you can, the, yeah. the dunk behind you takes color well. But sorry, keep going. I didn't hear right. the, I didn't hear the best and the brightest. And then, of course, how can I go without mentioning the Dunk SB? You know, to me, the Dunk SB is the first time that a brand said what's going on in the culture what's going on in the streets what are the kids saying let's listen to them for the first time and make product for them so it's the first time that a brand turned the tables because traditionally it was brand and athletes say we're gonna make this we're gonna sell it shove it down their throats nike sb was the first time that they were like yeah let's do a futura dunk let's do a heineken inspired dunk let's do a supreme dunk and it was really having a conversation with the consumers and then, of course, them allowing me into that conversation and being able to make history with these shoes is a ridiculous honor. So that's, that's my top three this week. Of course, I think for you too, it changes every week on your mood, right? Oh, yeah. Or, or I will, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I had the, uh, you know, my history of, of where I worked and what I've done. I got, I've been able to have a tremendous sneaker, sneaker collection and, I, and I'll unearth something or I'll unearth a certain Jordan or a certain Adidas shoe. And I'm like, wow, you know, like I just, my wife just got the, uh, Jocelyn just got the Prada uh, Superstar. And I looked at the Superstar again. I was just like, and you think of what that, you know, with the shell toe and run DMC and like the storytelling of that shoe and of, you know, of, yeah. of everything with, that, with Adidas and how Prada interpreted it with, the, with the, the super good quality leather and the shiny leather made in Italy. It's, there's another shoe that is just like, like that's a shoe you could wear every single day with every outfit and you'd be fine. Yep. You'd be fine. Yep. Yeah, Wait, I mean, who's, who's worse, you or Jocelyn? What is wor worse in terms of what? Like sneaker addiction, footwear addiction. Not even close, me. Not even, not even, <laughs> not even come close. To a, okay. To a, that she, we have, uh, I took over part of her closet for my sneakers and, and it will, she'll just be like another box. And, and I, my kids <laughs> don't know. My kids are like, they, oh, daddy sneakers, another, another package. They'll know. <laughs> I'll be like, my plug came through. My yeah, plug yeah. came through. Well, my man, that was, this cool. has been uh, this has been amazing, and I want I want I, don't even want to, I wanted to tell you something. I may as well tell it to everybody. Can do you mind if I go to the whiteboard for a second? And I'm going to talk for a second about you know people like Jeff and people like my partner Jane, is because people often ask me, you know. Actually, I shouldn't say often. I'm honored or humbled when people ask me, you know, how do I do this or how do I do that or how did you get to where you are? And I don't think I'm anywhere. I still have, you know, miles to go personally, professionally. But he, here's, what, here's what guys like Jeff Staple or Jamie Salter or Elon Musk or Steve Jobs have. Think of it this way. I'm going to throw these three words up there. You have dream, 
Can you see these words, Jeff? Yeah, clearly, crystal clear. You believe and you do. Three things we do all the time, all of us. And there's people that they dream and they do. And these circles, they collide. If you do that, you're going to be very, very successful in this spot right here. You're going to dream about something and you're going to get it done. Yes. But, but at the same time, if you don't have this blind belief or conviction about what you do, you'll stop eventually. Mm. And if you, you could do the same thing with two combinations of these words. You could just dream and you could believe, but if you don't do it, it doesn't Nothing work. happen. Right? You could have blind conviction and you could do it, but maybe the dream wasn't very good. Or the idea, the dream, mm -hmm. the dream to me, I don't like to use the word idea anymore because it's really a dream. Like some, someone somewhere, and his name is Steve Jobs, thought about, you know what, I'm going to fit 40,000 songs into something the size of a pack of cigarettes. And you're like, yep. are you insane? But yeah, right, that was his dream. So what, I'm gonna, I'll move it over here to do a nice one. So what guys like Jeff Staple or Jamie Salter have, and, and these guys are unicorns, okay? They have this. They, they dream. They have blind belief. And then most importantly, they do. This is, my daughter will be happy, is a unicorn. This is, you know, I don't know these people. Elon, Steve, I'm going to put my partner, Jamie Salter, in there. I'm going to put Jeff Staple in there. I'm going to put Shaquille O'Neal in there. I'm going to put Kobe Bryant in there, right? These people that they all had this belief, right? And they became this. They have blind belief and in, in conviction in what they're doing. They dream crazy big, but then most importantly, they execute. And all of us, I'm over here. I'm over here, and I'm trying to get... <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to get more over it than this piece, but all of you should think about that because these are the these are the innovators, these are the shakers, these are the movers that really kind of change things. And, I, and by the way, I'm talking. These, these are all very commercial. With great respect to them all, I'm sure you know Jonas Salk, um, you know Thomas Edison, uh, you know people that that changed the world. Martin Luther King, you know the mm -hmm. people that Muhammad Ali. Same thing. These are people that had cultural moments, Plato, Aristotle, whatever, whoever they may be, they're special unicorns. And those are the people that kind of move mountains. And I just hope that as we, as the world evolves, that there's more of those people and whether it's more altruistic or less altruistic, I don't know what it is, but it's something that is, is completely different and new and it's a unique thing. So you should all, everyone who's thinking about being a Jeff Staple or a Jamie Salter or a Shaquille O'Neal, you know, other than his prodigious physical abilities of, of being the man he is. I mean, he's a partner of ours and he does all this. So yeah, he, he yeah. can do basketball better than anybody else, but he also dreams, he believes and he does and he executes on it. Right. And that's what separates right. you, the unicorns from the rest of us. And by the way, you know, I put up, Martha Stewart is up here, you know? Yeah. There's other amazing people that have been able to, to uh, Oprah Winfrey is up here. You know, um, it, it, we could just you think, uh, Michelle you think, Obama. You think, believe, you think believe is the hardest one? What do, which one do you think is the one that most people are lacking in? Self belief and conviction in what you, in what you believe in and to go after and get it because it's so easy to look in the mirror and say, it's not going to work. My mom's going to tell me it's not going to work. My partner's going to tell me it's not going to work. Yeah. You have this yeah. blind belief. And, you know, if you hit that wall, you turn around and go to another wall, right? And I uh -huh. think all those times that I, that, you know, I, to your point, I gave you a, I, I set a pick for you with Jamie, right? And, yeah. right, you, you pivoted and you're like, okay, here I am. Or uh -huh. there's Kanye. I got his number. I'm going to foster this relationship. There's, there's Andre 3000, right? He's my man. Yeah. Now, right? Yeah. And you've got to be able to, to foster that and do that. So I just want right. you know, because we don't, we don't awesome. do this. I mean, we talk a lot, but we don't do this often. I was 
I was thinking about this on the on the train and thinking about this this circle here and now I'm gonna on these custom hoodies I made Jeff now I, now I know which one I'm gonna put on when I make one for you okay yes please this I want to put this but I, I, I hope everyone watching this appreciates how you broke it down because this is like the secret the secret recipe man this is like the the math calculation of life really and, and I appreciate that you put me in that pile. I mean, I don't, I don't think of it that way, but I, I'm, I'm honored to be in the same paragraph as those people you mentioned. Well, my man, um, God bless. Uh, I'm so happy that, you know, that you're, you and your family are safe and healthy and your dog. And um, I'll also <laughs> say, uh, and also, you know, I'll speak for Jeff when they say that, you know, we are everywhere, always thoughts go out. Lots of people affected by this crazy thing that's happened in the world and, and pray that everyone's safe and stays healthy and wear a mask and do all the other yep. stuff that you, that you should do. And, um, I can't wait to, uh, I can't wait to have some pasta with you in person. I need to have you over and, uh, and have it in person. Yeah, for sure. All right, Nick, this was great. Okay. Thanks. Great buddy. catching up. See you. All right. Bye. Bye.